So this is uh, a little bit more of a retrospective, so uh, something a little more historical in tunes. that has been around now for 21 years and I've been working on it for at least 20 of those years. <laughs> um, you can see uh, the release timeline here. The, the very first release it only lasted a couple of months and um, through the years uh, we got to the 2.4 release and we kind of stuck on it for probably far too long. If, if you look at that timeline, probably around 2011-2012, uh, we should have actually just called it 2.5. Um, this is kind of a, I would have to say this is Simus's fault. Um, the Simus customers are kind of allergic to upgrading to new version numbers. <laughs> and, and, uh, but at the same time, they wanted new features all the time. So we kept on cramming new features into the 2.4 release and claiming it was still 2.4 even though very, I mean, huge amounts were changing under the covers, but there we are. So over this talk, I'm, I'm looking at uh, the actual software versions of each of those releases and uh, I've decided to do a benchmark to show the performance over time. So uh, the benchmark characteristics here, we're, we're doing a one million entry database uh, we couldn't do much larger than that because the earlier versions were only 32-bit. Now this is running on uh, a 10-year-old server too. I mean, it's a 64-bit machine, but it's not, it's not super fast by any measure, not by today's measures. So uh, the database that I'm testing with uh, is constrained to be slightly smaller than two gigabytes. Um, and we actually, uh, on a 32-bit software build, we couldn't use more than two gigabytes anyways because standard table wouldn't let. Uh, I tried. <laughs> the uh, configurations here um, are, again, slightly less than optimal. Ordinarily, you'd want uh, to your cache to fill as much of the RAM as, as possible and as much of the database as possible. The cache sizes here are kept to about 1.8 gigabytes just to be uh, consistent from version to version. And so just to give you an idea of where things started and where we are today, on the very far left is the original UMISH 3.3 LDAP code. And uh, on the very far right is the current uh, 2.5 code that's in Git master. The, the scale of magnitude from there is actually 100 to 1. Um, in, uh, on the far left, we're doing 60 milliseconds per search. And on the far right, we're doing uh, 0.6 milliseconds per search. So I'll go through each of the different versions here and, and talk a little bit about the changes in each or the features in each and, and the performance impact. Also, I'm looking at uh, the bulk load time, the time to import the database. 
you can see it's all over the place from relatively fast to extremely slow. And I'll talk about some of those issues along the way as well. All right, so Open, Open LDAP itself started from uh, the last release of LDAP from the University of Michigan team. Uh, the UMich team got hired by Netscape. They went on and created Netscape directory server and you know, so many things spawned from that, Red Hat, Sun One, Sun DS. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, Open LDAP project was started by Kurt Zeilenga, who uh, doesn't show up at these things anymore because his, his new job won't let him. But uh, at the time, you know, Kurt was just looking for an LDAP server that he could use on, in, in his own software projects. And uh, so he picked up the, the source code from UMich LDAP and started to um, collect all the patches for the known bugs that had been floating around in email lists but hadn't been consolidated anywhere else. And that, that became the first uh, Open LDAP 1.0 release. So in the very beginning, we had the UMich 3.3 code. Uh, this, was <laughs> this was a challenge to even get it to compile on a modern Linux, but you know, with a few patches here and there, it actually started to run again. Um, and as I was saying, this is uh, doing 60, 60 milliseconds per search over a 1 million user database. I think back in 1996, nobody even had a 1 million user database. You know, this, at that time, we were testing with uh, probably at most tens of thousands. You know, but, so this is... Hmm? I thought UMich was 200,000. That was the original reason for standard limit. Uh, uh, that's possible. The, you know, the original user population at the university was only 40,000. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, okay, yeah, maybe with the, with the external, th then it would have hit 200,000, yeah. But they certainly weren't doing a million, and they had never envisioned doing a million. Uh, and, you know, the import speed actually wasn't too horrible. Uh, it's uh, eight minutes there. And this is using Berkeley DB 2.7, uh, using its uh, old style DBM interface. So the DBM interface was modeled after actually the AT&T database manager interface, and uh, that was preserved in uh, BSD Unix as Berkeley DB 1.85. So all of these Berkeley D, uh, DB releases are emulating a much older software version. All right, so um, you know there there were a lot of patches for the Emish code that had been floating around. People knew that there were bugs in the code and they had, there were known fixes for them, but they weren't all collected in one place. And so OpenLDAP 1.0 was the first time that all those patches had been consolidated together. It's funny that um, today is actually exactly 21 years since the final 1.0 release of OpenLDAP. And back then the project was very small. It was Kurt um, Halvard Furaseth from the uh, University of Norway and this guy Stuart Lynn. But obviously, you know, Kurt was doing the majority of the work, uh, 297 commits to, to his name. So the first release, uh, we actually see a, a slight performance jump over the UMish code. So that, that's the result of, you know, the various known bug fixes. And the, these were stupid things like, um, you know, libldap would, would keep uh, a linked list of all your outstanding requests and responses. And, uh, and it would order them back to front, but it would want to search them front to back. So it would always have to go to the back of the list and record. It was, it was amazing. Um, it was amazing that the code actually worked. But you know, so there were, there were a lot of really obvious mistakes in that code that, uh, that were fixed. And you see the LDF uh, speed didn't really change much at all. So some of the other things about the 1.0 release, uh, it actually had full thread support. Um, you know, the original code was single thread only. The UMich code was single thread. Uh, we had to worry about Y2K back then, and um, you know, date formats were, uh, we were transitioning from UTC time to generalized time. And 
ugly things like that. Uh, Kurt's preferred system was FreeBSD, so, so this release was primarily supported on FreeBSD. Uh, it, it always required a little bit of coaxing to, to build on Linux. And then uh, with the 1.1 release, uh, performance really doesn't change all that much. It, there's, there's a slight percentage difference here or there. And the LDIF import speed is about the same as well. So this was the very first attempt to port onto Windows NT. Um, it actually did build and run there. Uh, the build system was migrated into autoconf. And uh, there was an attempt at you know, native support for Berkeley DB's uh, API instead of the old DBM API. And you can see that the commit team is starting to grow. You know, people are starting to hear about the, the project. Then with 1.2, uh, again, a slight search, search improvement. Uh, import speed drastically improved. And here's where it's, it's like the Cambrian explosion. Uh, 21 contributors joined the project. That's, um, that's in fact, where I, where I started in. And at that, from this point for the next several years, the community just grew in you know, leaps and bounds. So the, uh, the biggest difference you'll notice is that import speeds got basically twice as fast. And uh, the main reason for that was some improvements in indexing and the very obvious thing that um, by default, it was generating a substring index on DNs, but, but LDAP doesn't allow you to do substring searches on DNs. So why were we building this index? Uh, so yeah, just deleting unused stupid indexes um, improved the import speed quite a lot. And also, this is where we added you know, um, creator's name, modifier, timestamp, all of that. Uh, they didn't exist before. So those, those creator modifier attributes actually had you know, a slowdown impact on on the throughput, but okay. So year 2000 comes, and we survived Y2K. Uh, OpenLDAP 2.0 gets released. You can see this performance has improved a little bit. Import time is way horrible. I mean, this is uh, almost an hour. No, sorry, that's yeah, it's almost an hour to, to import the one million users, um, and. Part of this is that we've upgraded to a new version of Berkeley DB, Berkeley 3.1. But there's, uh, there's also some other obvious considerations there. All right, so the, the main change is um, we added TLS support. Um, we also added authentication support with Sazzle. So this is all you know, bringing in the LDAP v3 authentication features. For uh, thread management in the 1.0 releases, we, um, we would spawn a new thread on every incoming operation. And it turns out you know, thread startup and shutdown time is, is significant. So in 2.0, we actually use a thread pool where um, we reuse the pool of ex existing threads for each e incoming operation. And that helped boost search performance quite a bit. Also, we added a new backend, back SQL, which um, <coughs> is still a strange beast. I mean, trying to talk to an SQL server through an LDAP interface is not the most convenient thing in the world. But I suppose if you have to get to the data there, that's one way to do it. So um, yeah, the significant slowdown in imports. And this is mainly because uh, we were doing a lot more schema validation. And uh, we were doing a lot more work with uh, Unicode normalization. Right? And the Unicode software support was just extremely slow. And this is kind of where Simus really enters the picture. I mean, I had done some small contributions to the previous versions, but this is where uh, Simus was building our own um, user management project, uh, IDM system you'd call it today. And it was built on top of OpenLDAP 2.0. And so a lot of the features that we needed um, were brought in, introduced into 2.0 in this time frame. For example, you know, we wanted uh, X500 style chaining. And up to this point, you know, I mean, the, the name SLAPD stands for standalone LDAP server. The, the entire philosophy of the UMICH project was that an LDAP server would be an island and it wouldn't talk to any other servers. Uh, but it was coming from 
you know, I mean, w we were coming from an experience of X500 where, you know, you have disp and you know, interaction between different directory servers. You have distribution of a tree across multiple servers, and that, that's what we wanted in, uh, in our use of OpenLDAP as well. So, uh, so I wrote back LDAP, and that, uh, that was my attempt to introduce, you know, uh, a mechanism for doing distribution in OpenLDAP. So I actually wrote that in OpenLDAP 1.2, but the patch got uh, accepted and merged into 2.0. It's funny that um, you know I thought this was going to be the sum total of my involvement in the OpenLDAP code base because then I was going to go back and work on the Simus product and not have to think about anything else. Uh, I never wanted to touch any of the other backends, and strangely enough, that's not how things worked out. Okay, so. OpenLDAP 2.1 comes along. We've upgraded to Berkeley DB 4.0. We're still using uh, the LDBM interface, which talks to the old uh, AT&T DBM API. But we also started supporting uh, Berkeley's native transaction API. And uh, so this is where BACBDB gets introduced to use the native uh, Berkeley database APIs. Um, now, the, that backend you know, got off to a rough start too. You can see here that the LDBM backend is still twice as fast as the Berkeley DB backend. And the import speeds are still pretty bad. Um, you know, for back LDBM, we did manage to improve things. Uh, and for Berkeley DB, just the, the overhead of Berkeley's transaction API is, is really what slows things down. But this is also the very first time we actually paid attention to the performance of the code. Um, I remember I had posted a question to the OpenLDAP development mailing list. Hey, has anybody ever profiled this? <laughs> Crickets. No, nobody, uh, nobody answered back. So I started profiling the code to see, you know, what are we doing? What's, what's actually going on here? Um, and, you know, these, these two points under here, revamping memory use and avoiding Runtime computation of strain lengths. Those those first proof of profiles that I ran back in in those days showed we were spending 50% of our CPU time in malloc and free, and 45% of our CPU time in strlen and strcat. We were spending 5% of our CPU time doing LDAP. <laughs> so so that was that's where um, that was coming out of OpenLDAP 2.0, and so in 2.1. Uh, you know, the, the big performance gains we got there was from fixing a lot of our use of malloc and getting rid of our use of string length and string, string cat. Uh, also in this time frame, we, uh, we had our first engagement with IBM to port OpenLDAP to uh, ZOS. And so I had to do a lot of uh, bending over backwards to make uh, an ASCII-based protocol work on an EBCDIC machine. That was interesting. Uh, okay, so we introduced back BDB, which is based on the native Berkeley DB API. And a few other things, you know, back meta, back monitor, back null, which is very important, right? It, it's the, it's the no-op backend. Every operation you send to it succeeds. Um, back Perl. We used, a, we used Perl very heavily back then, and, you know, we were embedding Perl scripts in LDAP directory entries and having them execute on the fly. Uh, so back Perl is a pretty cool cool toy. Um, I liked it a lot. I, I'm, I'm sad that we don't use Perl that much these days. We also had our very first OpenLDAP Developers Day in San Francisco and uh, presented some of these topics back then. All right, so you can see uh, in OpenLDAP 2.2 we have some performance regressions on the search speed, at least for LDBM. For back BDB, I think things actually got a little bit faster. Uh, LDAF import speeds are still bad for back BDB. Um, they're okay for back LDBM. And also we introduced back HDB in this time frame. So 2.2 has a lot of changes as well. You know, we, we added support for overlays and the very first ones were for dynamic groups and proxy caching. We introduced the sync REPL replication protocol uh, introduced back HDB, which was almost the same as back BDB, but it had support for 
an actual hierarchical namespace and supported atomic uh, tree renames. We added support for Slappy, uh, the SunDS uh, plugin API, or the Netscape DS API. And we started, uh, okay, at this point, all of the offline tools, or before this point, all the offline tools were separate binaries. Um, we started to merge them into the SlapD binary so that we could get better support on Windows. Uh, in Windows, um, every dynamic module needs to be fully resolved at, at build time, at link time. And uh, it has to be resolved to an actual file name. And so if you want your back end to be a dynamic module, you can't resolve it against both a slap tool name and against the slap D binary at the same time. And so we had to move everything into the slap D binary just so that dynamic loading would work. Also, we added uh, the Samba Kerberos 5 password overlay, which you know, allows slap D to maintain a single password store that is usable by Samba 3 and Kerberos KDC at the same time. All of this work um, was driven by, mostly by Luke Howard's efforts. He was writing his XAD product at that time, which was the very first uh, outside implementation of Active Directory protocols based on OpenLDAP. Uh, so a lot of the work, yeah, a lot of that work, the Slappy support was to support XAD. Uh, SMB K5 PWD was to support XAD and a few other features like that. In OpenLDAP 2.3, you can see that you know, back LDBM is still performing pretty decently. Back BDB is still performing fairly slowly. Uh, the set of numbers here, there's three columns for the beginning of the release series and three columns for the end of the re release series. So by, by OpenLDAP 2.3.43, we actually had back BDB performance uh, you know, tolerable or in a decent place. It's one thing to note here, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going from hundreds of queries per second now to 21, 22,000 queries per second. At this point in time, this is around the year 2004, 2005, actually OpenLDAP was the fastest directory server on the market already. These, these search performance numbers, I mean, they don't impress me today, but at, at that time they were actually pretty good numbers. Of course, our import speeds were still pretty horrible. Um, and that doesn't change for a while. But uh, OpenLDAP itself had started getting uh, enterprise acceptance. You know, uh, Hewlett Packard came to Simus and, and started uh, to use OpenLDAP as its internal corporate directory. Uh, other large corporations were, were finally s taking it seriously and saying this is, this is a useful solution. But along with that, you know, they wanted, um, they wanted zero downtime. And uh, having to restart a server to make configuration changes is unacceptable. So this is where we release CN equals config to do you know, online configuration management. Um, and a lot more overlays got written. Uh, most of these were written at Hewlett Packard's request because you know, they wanted these features that they were used to in SunDS, which they, they'd been using before. So a lot of these features came from you know, a, a SunDS feature list. We also uh, added a quick mode for slap add to try and overcome some of the, the performance problems of, of Berkeley DB's transaction API. We basically turn off the transaction API when we're using quick mode. Uh, okay, we also did some more work with Sync Rebel, introducing the Delta Sync Rebel mechanism, which you know, saves on network bandwidth because we only send changes instead of full entries. And we started working with a multi-threaded indexer for the back BDB backend. So originally, um, you know, an import just used a single thread, and you know, you read an LDF file, and you start spitting it into the database. Uh, with the multi-threaded indexer, we would use one thread per attribute. So if you have, you know, 30 or 40 indices defined, um, you could get a decent 
performance boost out of the indexing task. And indexing tended to be the most expensive part of uh, import. So this was a decent improvement. Along the way, we discovered that uh, Berkeley DB 4.6, which we had just migrated to, had a massive internal bug. Um, and so we had to add an actual explicit configure test to detect that version and say, yeah, you don't want to use this version. At this point, we also added ePoll support uh, to you know, better improve our scaling of uh, connection handling. Uh, until this point, we were just using select, which was the standard you know, BSD system call. Um, Google actually commissioned us to do the ePoll work because they were using OpenLDAP internally and they needed, uh, they needed to support you know, thousands of connections, which we had never tested before. So up until this point, I think we had tested on the order of 6,428 connections per server. And uh, with the Google work, you know, we had tested up to 4,000, 8,000 connections per server. So that, again, that was some significant stuff that Google contributed to. Also during this time frame, uh, Kurt Zelenga stepped down from the project and I took over as a project lead. And so we come to OpenLDAP 2.4. We're still using Berkeley DB. We stuck with Berkeley 4.2 for a very long time, for at least 10 years. Um, and you know, that, that seemed to be the stable, reliable version for a long time. Uh, and then by the end of the release stream, by present day, you know, we, we use Berkeley 5.2 or 5.3. The, the last actual version we can legally use is 5.3.21. Um, in Berkeley 6.0, uh, Oracle changed the license to the AGPL. The AGPL requires that uh, any network service that uses Berkeley DB must provide a notice to its users of how and where to obtain the project source code. And uh, there's no way we can fit that into an LDAP bind response. <laughs> so basically, it's, you know, it is technically impossible for us to comply with the AGPL. So we had to, I mean, we were forced to abandon Berkeley DB at the point anyway. And uh, obviously, in the middle of the 2.4 stream, this is where we introduced uh, LMDB and the LMDB backend. And that's, that's where you get the, the large performance jump in search performance here. Uh, import speeds, again, uh, mostly kind of bad. They start to improve a little bit. Uh, and with uh, LMDB, they improve quite a lot. So other changes, yeah. Can you go back to stats? Sure, which one? Yes. Yeah. That, that, so um, by the end of you know by 2.4.47, which is what we're looking at here. Sorry, this is the middle. 2.4.27, we had worked out a lot of locking issues in the Berkeley Cache Manager, and so that's where the, where we got a lot of performance back. Yeah. Um, so that one of the things that's not present on these slides, um, the memory use. Is, is significantly different. You know, with uh, back MDB, we're using a quarter as much memory as with back BDB. All right, so a couple of other changes. You know, we worked on the connection manager some more. We have the lightweight dispatcher, which uh, improved the latency between the time that we receive an operation and the time that we dispatch it to the back end. Uh, back MDB. Database backend is introduced. It was basically a, a, a you know copy and paste of back HDB with with the letter H replaced with M, and mostly it just worked. Uh, we also added support for GNU TLS at at the request of the Debian project. Uh, for some reason, they they only like GPL and they didn't like the Open SSL license or whatever and. Um, we added support for Mozilla NSS at the request of Red Hat, which I find ironic these days. 
but and we had you know uh, additional features in CN equals config. There there were options in CN equals config that could not be modified in 2.3 without a server restart, and we made more of them you know uh, runtime changeable. So <coughs> again, just to minimize any any cases where we needed to restart the server. We also worked on a project uh, with. Actually, this was in partnership with Sun and MySQL, um, the backend AB backend, which used the MySQL cluster. And that, that was fairly promising. Um, you know, it, uh, the MySQL cluster database actually has very good scaling characteristics. Um, in a single node setup, you wouldn't use it. It would be much slower than one of our other backends. But if you were you know, trying to shard a lot of data across many servers and the cluster backend worked fairly well. And it's a shame that uh, after Oracle acquired Sun, they, they completely cut, killed that project. Um, the code's still in, in the Git repo, but uh, you know, we had planned a set of additional features to go into it that never got in. Unfortunate. Uh, we had uh, introduced the socket backend, which lets you um, set up a backend that will talk to any external uh, any external process over a Unix domain socket. A few more overlays and a lot more contrib modules, some related to our Samba 4 integration work and other features. And then in uh, 2.5, um, the code that we, we have in Git today that we plan to release in a couple of months, sorry, it's November now, so it, next month. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we've actually, in the Git master, we've deleted the Berkeley DB code. Um, you know, so going forward, it'll, it'll just be LMDB. I mean, there, there are some other backends too, but LMDB MD is the one that, that really matters. And also, you know, our import speeds have drastically improved again. So we're actually, you know, finally faster than 1.0. Uh, the main main thing going on here, we you know we had a good chance to analyze uh, other bottlenecks in the system. Uh, again, funny enough, Oracle invited us to their headquarters in Dublin to do some benchmarking on one of their um, enterprise servers. It was a 2048 CPU box, and uh, and we got to see just how well does OpenLDAP scale. And in the initial test, you know, we found, oh, look, there's this mutex we're taking here that we really shouldn't. And after we got rid of that, uh, we found that the kernel was the actual bottleneck. So at this point, you know, OpenLDAP scales better than the OS. Uh, we, we can use 2048 CPUs uh, with pretty much no overhead. Um, and the OS will be the thing that slows you down. You know, we, can, we can run at line speed up to hundreds of gigabits per second now without any, without any issue. Um, and again, some, some of those changes, uh, I mean, we proved them at the, open, uh, at the Oracle site, but we had developed these at, at other, uh, other sites on smaller tests. And, uh, you know, th there are still new features going into the 2.5 code base even, even now, so there, there are other things coming down the line. Yeah. I'm curious, who came up with CN equals config first, you or uh, Sun? I think they had it first. Oh. Yeah. Uh, also, I'm just, uh, I never worked with, I worked with X400, not X500. Okay. And so I'm just kind of curious, uh, do you have any like stories of how that worked and like what, you, what people did with it? Is, X5, I can only imagine. X400 email or X500? X400 email, yeah. Um, I'm curious about X500, which I, I know was related. That was like the directory server yeah. that was supposed to work with X400. Uh, I mean, you know, when I was at University of Michigan, all of these things were, you know, being brought online for the first time. Uh, X400 was kind of a curiosity. Nobody actually used it for anything they depended on, uh, and X500 obviously was the directory you needed to have for X400 to run. Um, and after I left UMich, the next time I ran into it was uh, when I was working with Matt at Locust and Platinum. Uh, 
you know, the DCE distributed computing environment was built around an X500 server. And uh, so all of the resources, you know, computers and accounts and everything were registered in the X500 service there. Did it work well? I mean, did, did people have a lot of problems with it? Or, I mean it mostly worked. The, the biggest problem people had with it was, at, uh, at the time, uh, it was a very large software stack, and it was probably larger than most computers could run. Uh, now, at the same time, you know, this became a myth that X500 was too big for the computers of the time. And we found, uh, like when we tripped over this company called Datacraft based out of uh, Australia, you know, they had a, a full ISO protocol stack that ran in under 64K of RAM. And so the reality was it was possible to do OSI and X500 without a massive footprint. It's just that the primary vendors of the day didn't do a good job. Distribution yeah. service work in X500. Yeah. The research networks have a very big working. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, distribution, so chaining and referrals and all that sort of stuff certainly work very well in X500. Uh, and that's what we lost by moving to LDAP. Uh, and we've been sort of scurrying to it back ever since. Yeah. Um, but even back in the uh, late 80s, I suppose, there was a million plus entry. Uh, service running across the academic communities of Europe, the US, and Australia uh, with, I guess, what, 100 DSAs running? Yeah. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, the Paradise uh, Network? Not protocols, because right. yeah. in the UK we weren't supposed to use IP, uh, so all of ours had to run CLNS or comms. Um, and it, it all gateway, it all worked. Um, but I think actually one of the original things that caused the image server to uh, to be written um, was that at the time the easiest server, uh, X500 server to get hold of was Quipu, uh, which is a research project which had been written at University College London and Nottingham uh, with some help from Marshall Rose. Um, and it loaded all its data into memory structures at boot time. And as I mentioned earlier, UMich had 200,000 people in their directory. Uh, this was running on a microvax. It took two days to boot. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't totally reliable. <laughs> <laughs> so they needed something else. Yeah, yeah. OK, so uh, great story, Howard. Uh, for anybody in the audience who's thinking of joining them or starting a project, have hopes of being as successful as you know that. What's the biggest lesson you could give somebody? Of, uh, maybe this is something you need to think about. And then the second question would be, what do you see as the biggest challenge going forward to maintain the success of the project? Yeah, I would have to think about that first question. First of all, I, I don't have an answer. The, you know, off the top of my head to that, I would say um, a, a similar answer I could give you is when I realized that Simus had survived. You know, I mean, we were a, a tiny startup back in 1999-2000 and uh, struggling in the first couple of years. It was actually 10 years into the company before I realized, oh hey, we're not struggling anymore. And uh, so success is something that surprises me. And uh, I, I, I can't really tell you how it came. So what about the second one, biggest challenge that you see going forward? Uh, I think, you know, if you, if you look at the people saying, is LDAP dead? You know, the, the big challenge is uh, one in awareness and perception. You know, the technology is very mature and very stable, very reliable, highly efficient. You know, there's nothing else on the planet as efficient as what we have. There's, you know, none of the big data stores are anywhere close. Uh, you know, if you look at other projects around the world now, high performance computing, every HPC installation in the US uses LMDB. If you look at machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, neural networks, 
every single project in the world uses LMDB. All right, so the technologies we built here are unmatched by anything else in the world. So it's really, we don't have any te technological challenges now. We have marketing and perception challenges. Hmm. Do you have a question? Okay, two questions. Um, I understand that um, OpenLab uses SLMARC for memory allocating. SLMARC by default. Probably um, SLMARC is historical stuff. So, so I always worried about memory leak and buffer overflow when developing overlay or backend. So, by the way, there are many MARC implementations uh, in recent years. So, JE MARC or Microsoft Publish pretty neat MARC implementation. Yeah. So, they have useful features such as memory leak checking or prevent buffer overflow. Mm -hmm. So I feel there, there is no reason to use SL mark. So do you, do you have a plan to abandon uh, use, to use SL, SL mark by default? Yes, SL malloc still outperforms all of them. And also on the subject of memory leaks, uh, I happen to have written a tool called mleak, which is available on GitHub. It's actually about <coughs> 10 times faster than every other leak tracer out there. So uh, you'll find that, you know, I mean, you know, I've used the leak tracer in JE Malik and uh, TC Malik, et cetera. No, I mean, we, we have better tools for that. Uh, the other thing uh, with buffer overflows, you know, if, if you're using the OpenLDAP APIs, uh, you know, our string functions are, are designed to be impossible to overflow, right? If, um, if you talk about, um, <coughs> could I put up a different set of slides? Because this is something in, in a completely separate talk of mine, but I actually address that directly. No time, I'm sorry, all right. But yeah, that buffer overflows are not an issue in our code. Right. <coughs> Last very quick question. So thanks for this. Uh, you get nostalgic feelings hearing your talk. <laughs> uh, there, there, there was one uh, point in time where Oracle was quite uh, disruptive, uh, uh, abandoning this MySQL uh, um, stuff uh, uh, for the NDB um, uh, backend. Were there at that time or after that any thoughts about replacing MySQL with Postgres for, for such a, a SQL backend? Uh, okay, the back NDB did not use SQL. It used uh, the, the low-level block interface yeah. to, that, to that engine. And so uh, this was not an SQL effort. And so Postgres wouldn't be useful there. Thank you. Thank you.